16 last time, two weeks ago. But the Apostle Paul, just kind of get in your mind what's taking place. He's been under arrest because the Jews just about attacked him when they saw him in Jerusalem. And not the believing Jews, but the unbelieving Jews thought that he had taken a Gentile into the temple in a previous visit to Jerusalem. And the Jews of Asia stirred up a riot. They were about to kill him. Uh, the chief captain of the Roman soldiers came and pulled him out, but didn't know exactly what the, the, the riot was about. And as Paul was being brought up to the castle steps, he asked if he could address the Jews. So not knowing what this was about, the captain gave him the, the uh, license to go ahead. And so Paul starts dealing with them, and he takes them through the course of his life, as I was describing. And, and he, he first shows how he was just like them in his zeal for the law and, and against the name of Christ. Uh, but then the road to Damascus changed his life as the Lord appeared to him and called him. And then when he, from the road to Damascus, he was left blind and led by the hand to the city of Damascus where a man named Ananias met him. And I want to pick up where that, uh, and because that's what verse 16 is tied into Ananias. It says in verse 12, Acts 22 verse 12. Now this is Paul giving his testimony and hopefully you understood when I said the road to Damascus, that's when Jesus Christ shined his light upon Saul of Tarsus there, who's, who's Paul the Apostle. Shined, wasn't then, but shined his light on him and, uh, and, and at least revealed himself as the resurrected Lord to, to him. When asked what to do, he said, go to Damascus, it'll be told you. So he's now blinded by that light, and he goes to Damascus. In verse 12 it says, And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. In the same hour I looked upon him. So we were mentioning the arguments that Paul was given. Not only the five steps in his life, there were seven proofs that, that what is happening with him is the calling of the Lord. And, uh, and so one of the things in saying that Ananias, Ananias, a devout man according to the law, that, the, that Paul is actually telling the Jews, he's relating Ananias to these Jews who are zealous of the law. He doesn't necessarily mention the fact that Ananias himself is a believer in the Lord. Because these people that are against Paul, they're not believers in the Lord, that wouldn't mean anything to him. But the fact that he's a devout man according to the law would. And the fact that Paul being blinded now sees is evidence that a miracle had been done. And that certainly this event that he's talking about is of God. And, uh, and so he received his sight. Um, verse 14, and he said, the, Lord, uh, the God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see the just one, and hear the voice of his mouth. For, uh, for thou, hast been his, uh, shalt, thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. So I first said there were three, but there's really, when you conclude verse 15, there's really four things that Ananias tells Saul, Paul, when he got to the city there. And that is that the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, hath chosen... Saul, that he should know his will. So there's a reason that he's been called. Ananias isn't told completely what that will is. In chapter 9 it says he's going to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. But Saul has been chosen that he's going to be, it's going to be revealed to him what God's will is. And that thou shouldest, uh, uh, um, that thou shouldest know his will and see the just one. Not only has, has Saul seen the glory of Jesus Christ shine on him as a light, but the Lord Jesus Christ is going to reveal himself more to Saul of Tarsus, who is Paul the Apostle. And it says, and thou shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. Well, if you hear the voice of the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Word of God, <laughs> you're going to hear the Word of God. <laughs> He's going, to be, he's going to receive revelation. He's going to know God's will. He's going, to re, he's going to see the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to receive revelation from Jesus Christ. And, uh, and those things will take place. And they'll even take place in verse 17 and 18 uh, very quickly. 
in, 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 in partial regards. There'll be more revelation that Saul will receive, but he's leading up to a certain point. And so Ananias told him these things, and the fulfillment will come in verse 17 and 18. But in verse 15, not only did he tell him those three things, verse 15 says, And thou shalt be his witness, uh, thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. Now, I don't think the Jews are catching on here, but remember Saul, uh, Paul, here addressing the unbelieving Jews, that these unbelieving Jews through time have learned to cooperate with the believing Jews. Remember in chapter 21, James and, and the elders of Jerusalem first met with Paul, and they told Paul, look how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they're all zealous of the law. Well, the Jews, the unbelieving Jews, they don't have a problem with James and the elders of Israel and the thousands that believe in Jesus, but they do have a problem with Paul. And their problem with Paul is that they know that he has some kind of ministry among Gentiles that they resent. So he's different. They recognize Paul is different than the other Jews that are among them. And I say that to you because in verse 15, when Ananias told Paul, that thou shalt be his witness unto all men. I'm not sure if that went over their head or not, but it's certainly laying a groundwork of the fulfillment of that Jesus Christ is going to reveal his will to Saul, that he has an all men's ministry, not just a nation of Israel ministry. <clears throat> and anyhow, so, but when he said that, there's something interesting how Ananias only told Paul part of what the Lord told Paul on the road to Damascus. Because in verse 15, Ananias tells Paul, Thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. That's past tense. So Paul can witness to the fact that he had seen the light of the glory of Jesus Christ and heard his voice on the road to Damascus and realized that the name of Jesus Christ that he was trying to stamp out is actually Jesus Christ who is indeed risen from the dead. And so the past tense is the witness of the resurrected Lord that he learned about on the road to Damascus. So he knows that Jesus is the Christ, as, it, as he began to teach immediately in the synagogues. But hold your place here and come to chapter 26. Paul will give his own testimony again to a Gentile later, to a king and others that are present in a, in a court setting. And when he talks about the, the, the event on the road to Damascus and the Lord appearing to him, he says in verse 16 concerning what the Lord told Paul on the road to Damascus, he said, But arise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of those things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. Now, Paul's not about to deal <laughs> with the Jews in, in chapter 22 with what God is going to reveal to him because it's all about Gentile ministry, which they resent. But the very fact that this, there's Jews among them that believe that Jesus is the Christ and is indeed risen from the dead. And so back in chapter 22, it's not even Paul talking. It's Paul telling the Jews there what Ananias told him. And, and he just brings out the first part of that. So you notice there is both in chapter 26, verse 16, the things thou hast seen and the things in which I will appear unto thee. So there's been a revelation to Paul on the road to Damascus, but that's only the beginning of the revelation to Paul. There's going to be more that's going to follow. In fact, there's many progressive revelations given to the Apostle Paul concerning his calling and his Gentile ministry and the doctrine of grace to the Gentiles. But... But when, he, when Ananias talks about it, he just talks about the things that thou hast seen. And, uh, and, and so that's all Paul's dealing with in chapter 22, is that he has met the, the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. He is risen, and there's several other Jews that believe that as well. So Ananias comes and, and tells Saul what the Lord had revealed to him, that, that it's uh, God's will for Saul to, Paul to, to know his will, to see the just one, I'm back in chapter 22, verse 14. And to hear the voice of his mouth, he's going to receive revelation, and shall be a witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. Then Ananias, continuing talking to Paul, says, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. 
Now that is a, a verse of scripture that, that we need to deal with here. We so often talk about how water baptism has no place in the age of grace and that water baptism was a part of Israel's program and, and that Paul's our apostle, but here our apostle is told to get water baptized and wash away his sins calling upon the name of the Lord. And sometimes people who don't want to acknowledge Paul's ministry, Paul's revelation, a separate gospel given to the Apostle Paul, will use a verse like this to say, no, no, it's just a continuation of what was going on before that, and Paul himself was baptized, therefore we should be baptized. And, and in, a, in a baby way, you can understand their logic. I mean, in simplified form, you think, oh, well, that, that, that does make sense. Um, so we need to look at the verse, and sometimes a verse like that, you know, to be honest, you, you would wish it wasn't in the Bible so you didn't have to explain it. That, that's, you know, that's, what, that's nonsense anyhow, to wish something wasn't there. But, you know, the other, the other way of looking at that, by looking at that verse, there's a blessing in understanding this. And, and when you see the blessing in understanding this, you, you appreciate the verse rather than looking at it, wishing that you didn't have to explain it to someone, uh, that there is a, a, an understanding in the verse that brings better understanding even to my, my uh, thinking on the gospel of the kingdom. Now, the first thing that we want to realize is that Ananias is a devout man under the law coming to the Apostle Paul, and he is definitely going to tell Paul to do what every Jewish believer was told to do who believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so we wouldn't expect Ananias to say anything different to Paul. Ananias wasn't given a revelation of grace and, and the, the cross work of Christ to explain to the Apostle Paul. Paul tells you in Galatians chapter uh, 1 and verse 11, in fact, he says, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel I preached, I didn't receive it of man, neither, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the gospel that Paul preached, he received from Jesus Christ as a revelation and went and preached. So Ananias would have no idea what is going to be revealed to the Apostle Paul. He just knows what all believing Jew, Jews did up to that time. And so he's telling Paul what to do based on the kingdom gospel message. And at this point, even Saul himself hasn't received revelation of the gospel he's supposed to go out. He's told he's going to go preach to the Gentiles, but he's not told yet what he's going to preach to the Gentiles. So, so there, when we look at this, we shouldn't even... Be, be concerned about the fact that, that he was told to do this because naturally he would do this as a believing Jew. Now, what we need to keep really focused on, though, is we're not saved by why, what Ananias told Saul to do. We are saved by what Jesus Christ told us Gentiles to do. And uh, I'll come back to this verse, but just to show you a couple verses to consider like that, come over, first of all, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, you do understand what I just said, right? And that, that's what those who want to try to ignore Paul's revelation and the message that Paul was given to preach to us Gentiles. And you have to ignore a lot of verses to do that. But those who want to ignore that will follow that type of thinking, saying that we should do what Ananias told Paul. But no, we should do what Jesus Christ told Paul to tell us to do. <laughs> and, and that's not too hard to understand, but... Some just refuse to understand that. When Paul talks about the gospel that he preached, now remember, I already just told you, I quoted the verse, Galatians chapter 1, 11, that the gospel he preached, he received by revelation from Jesus Christ. He didn't get it from Ananias. He didn't get it from the apostles before him. He got it as a revelation of Jesus, from Jesus Christ. He says the same thing here in a little different way. Chapter 15, verse 1, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. So the one that he preached is the one he got from revelation from Jesus Christ, and he preached it to the Corinthians, uh, so to the Gentiles, um, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Now if you didn't believe, if you didn't believe what Paul said when he preached the gospel to them, then you believed in vain. And, uh, and then you're not saved. But if you believe what Paul preached when he was there, then you're saved, based on those verses. So what did he preach when he was there? He said, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. 
So there's the revelation Jesus Christ gave to Paul to preach to us Gentiles. He himself received it and then preached it to them. He received it and as the message he's supposed to preach to the Gentiles, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now that's what He received and delivered to them, received of the Lord and delivered it to the Gentiles. And He says, if you believe that, you're saved. Didn't, say, didn't tell you to do anything. Just told you to believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and rose the third day again, according to the Scriptures. Um, so that by believing the, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for our sins, Paul says you're saved, because that's the message he received and delivered to us. Now, look over with me to Ephesians. We had a men's meeting years ago, I mean, long time ago. And we read the book of Ephesians, replacing the ye with Gentiles. It was kind of interesting doing that. I, I, I guess I just say it to you, play around with it when you're in your own reading. But it comes out of, out of this thinking. If you look at chapter 1, verse uh, 11, now Paul's talking about how we're blessed. Ephesians 1, 11. It says, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, in whom also, yeah, we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted. It's interesting how he goes from we to ye, but certainly the Jews had the gospel presented to them, and I'm not sure even those verses are just refer reference to Jews, but I know these verses in verse 13 and 14 are particularly what he's saying to Gentiles. That's, it says, In whom, speaking about Christ, ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Now see, there was a gospel of Israel's salvation. There was a kingdom message, the, Mes the Messianic message to the nation of Israel, but there came a time in which God, through Paul, turned to us Gentiles, and Paul says, when you trusted Christ, you did that after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. This is Gentile salvation, not Israel salvation, Gentile salvation. Israel salvation did involve water baptism. Not that that could ever save them, I'll show you that in a moment, but, but the point is, is that their obedience to faith required them to be water baptized. Our obedience to faith doesn't require water baptism. It requires faith alone in the finished work of Christ. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So I, I read that verse just so that you see how Paul talks about the gospel of your salvation. That's Gentile salvation. Now, look at it and think about that the same way when you look at Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It says, for by grace are ye saved through faith. Now, everybody's saved by grace, and everybody's really saved by faith, but not faith alone. But, but when he says, for by grace are ye saved, he's certainly talking about God's purpose for us as members of the body of Christ, referring to our, us Gentiles. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And again, I read those verses, not only does it talk about your salvation, but your salvation is so much based on grace, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not of yourself. It's a gift from God that you receive on the basis of faith, and faith alone is what saves. Now, there's tons of verses that we can go and show that, that the gospel message that Paul preached, Romans, we, we label it just in the, in the statement of justification by faith alone, it's what Romans chapter 3 and 4 is all about, that God will declare you righteous freely by His grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. So we're not obligated to do anything. In fact, when you consider Romans 4, 4 and 5, in fact, look at that, if I give you one more about that. Romans chapter 4,
the gospel of Gentile salvation is all about the cross work of Christ, the free gift of eternal life that's given to us through the redemption that Jesus Christ made for us on the cross, the purchase, the payment for our sins made for us at the cross, the purchase of our liberty. And so much is it on the basis of grace and not of works and not of yourself that Romans chapter 4 says in verse 4, Now to him that worketh, so a guy says, okay, I'll accept it on grace through faith, but I'm going to continue to work too. Now, not just work to honor God, to work for your salvation, to do works for salvation. Now, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Either you come to God through Christ by grace, or you come to God without Christ based on your works. And what you're going to be rewarded for <laughs> is a debt because you're going to have eternally damned in paying for your own sins if you don't trust Jesus Christ as the one who died for your sins. So that if you, if you continue to work, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but a debt. You've got a debt that you're never going to pay off. It's going to be eternal. But to him that worketh not, you stop trying to earn your own salvation. But believe on him that justifieth the ungodly. That's what Jesus Christ did on the cross. He, he died for our offenses and was raised for our justification. And God has declared a believer righteous through the death, burial, and resurrection. So believe on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. So God's waiting today in the age of grace for us just to believe and then God counts us righteous. Now that's the message Paul was given to Paul to us Gentiles. Ananias had a different message for Saul uh, after he came to Damascus after seeing the Lord on the road. And, and what Ananias tells Saul to do is what all the believing Jews were doing up until Saul because that was the message that was given to them. Now even with that message, here's where the blessing is. Go back to Acts chapter 22. And look closely at verse 16. Ananias tells Saul, And, and now why tarriest thou? What does it say in chapter 9? Um, oh, there's, there's a reference to him, like, don't put it off. I shouldn't even brought it up. I didn't remember it. Continue back to verse 16. <laughs> and now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now this actually puts together some things about the kingdom message that sometimes when we talk about water baptism being part of the nation of Israel, you start out with the ministry of John the Baptist who introduced this, this baptism unto Christ uh, in, in, the, in the gospel of the kingdom. Now, their baptisms did exist in the Old Testament. All kinds of washings took place in the Old Testament. But John the Baptist is calling the nation of Israel to repentance in introducing, being a forerunner, introducing the Messiah to be showing up. And in that, there's, there's a couple things. First of all, go back to Luke chapter 7. Now remember, there's, there in Jerusalem, when Paul's addressing the, the Jews there in Acts chapter 22... He's addressing the unbelieving Jews, but there's a bunch of believing Jews, and the difference between them is something described right here in, Romans chap in Luke chapter 7. Jesus Christ is talking about John the Baptist, and he says in verse 28 of Luke 7, And I say unto you, among those that were born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And all the people that heard him, that heard John preach, the, and the publicans, justified God. They declared God was right in speaking through John, being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. So when John is introducing the Messiah coming 
and he was preaching what's called the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, that, that those who believed John's message and was looking for the kingdom and the Messiah to come were declaring that God is right, they were out of the will of God, they had broken God's laws, but they were going to be, they were, they were repentant, they were confessing their sins in that baptism, and going to be identified with the salvation that's going to come through the Messiah and the setting up his, of His kingdom. Those who refused to get water baptized by John said, no, we're right with God, we haven't done anything wrong, and we're not looking for this Messiah that's supposed to be showing up and bringing in the kingdom. So God is making a difference within the nation of Israel, the believing remnant from the unbelieving. And when, when Ananias told Saul, rise and be baptized, wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord, Saul was a demonstrating that he is one who's going to be a repentant Jew, who's going to believe in the Messiah at that point. And, and he's going to call upon the name of the Lord, going to wash away, rise and be ba baptized, calling upon the name. I want those three points, and I want them right, said right. <laughs> Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. Now, think about that. Wash away thy sins. You think water washed away sins? Certainly there's a figurative sense, because if you're going to be water baptized, there's some kind of washing, and that's what the, 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 the baptismal ceremonies all through the Old Testament of washings um, was uh, a water cleansing. But could water cleanse sin? Well, no, never could. Even, in, even if you kind of relate it to, as we know from the book of Hebrews, when it comes to the blood of bulls and goats, they could never take away sin. Although they were told to do those things and there would be forgiveness for them, but it wasn't the actual remedy. So that there is, there is something here in, in John's baptism. We know from John chapter 1 that he came baptizing to introduce Jesus Christ to the nation of Israel. Now think about it. Saul's told, arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, doing what? Calling upon the name of the Lord. Israel's faith required them to be water baptized. That water baptism identified them as part of the repentant nation of Israel who was going to look to the Messiah to save them. Now, look, look all the way back to John, uh, no, Matthew chapter 1. They're not looking just for water to save them. That's my point. And I, maybe you're smarter than that. But sometimes we emphasize water so much that we leave out the Messiah. <laughs> when Jesus Christ was being born, it says um, in Matthew chapter 1 in verse uh, 21, speaking to Mary, and she, or to, to Joseph about Mary, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Their, their sins aren't going to be dealt with just by them being water baptized. But them being water baptized, John says he's introducing Christ to Israel. And this verse says he's going to save his people from their sin. Now, if you're not identified with him, your sins aren't going to be taken care of. So the water baptism was required as an obedience to faith concerning the nation of Israel, what God told John to do, and what, what God's message for the kingdom believer to do is to be water baptized. But they're being identified with their Messiah, and He's the one that was going to save them from their sins. Look over in chapter 28 of Matthew. Now remember, they don't understand when Jesus Christ is going to go to the cross that He is going to pay for their sins. They don't understand that. They don't understand that until the Apostle Paul explains the accomplishments of Christ on the cross. They do understand that he had to suffer before he could reign in his glory. And so they're, they're going to learn that he had to suffer first and rise from the dead, and then he could set up the kingdom. But as far as all that was accomplished in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as a full, complete, a payment for their sins, it, there doesn't seem to be any understanding among the apostles until all that's revealed to Paul, and then they understand it as well. I say that because Jesus Christ, when, just before he died, when he, when he was having what we call the Last Supper and, and the communion with them, he, he says in verse uh, 20, 
27, Matthew 26, verse 27, And he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. I'll wait for you. Verse 28 says, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, you're only a couple pages away, so it would be easy to look over. Just flip a few pages to Mark chapter 1 and look at verse 4. It says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So baptism was required for remission of sins, was it not? But what is going to, what is going to remit the sins? Well, we just read Jesus Christ said that this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So the water baptism for the remission of sins, the way it works is they get water baptized to identify with Jesus Christ, who's going to shed his blood for the remission of their sins. Ultimately, the way the sins are dealt with is the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, I, I don't say they understood that at that time, and, and they didn't. But ultimately, it's revealed that that is what took care of sin once and for all. That's what the book of Hebrews is all about for the Jewish people. That's what the book of Romans is about for us Gentiles. So when Ananias told Saul, Arise, why tarry thou, arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling out upon the name of the Lord, it's not just the water baptism that's washing away sins. There is this, also this calling upon the name of the Lord because he's the one who's going to save from sin. And ultimately, look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. When you put that together, that, that's how you see the progressive revelation so that when you get to the book of Revelation, it reads a different way. Oh, it's verse 5, isn't it? Yep. Revelation 1, verse 5. It says, talking about the book being written, being sent to the seven churches from, and it, it says in verse 5, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten from the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. So he's the faithful witness. He came as the true prophet of God. And he died as the priest for the nation of Israel, raised from the dead. And that, that's the priestly work that he did. And, and it says, and the, and the prince of the kings of the earth. Well, he raised from the dead. He's going to be king when he comes back. So he's prince of the kings of the earth at this point. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's where the washing comes from. Certainly, the water baptism identifies you with Jesus Christ, and it's His blood that finally washed away those sins permanently, completely, and not just typically, but actually. And it's the blood of Jesus Christ that took care of even the kingdom church, uh, kingdom believers' uh, sins as well. And uh, so, so that, as Ananias is telling Paul, that, that expression there, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Isn't it always salvation is calling on the name of the Lord? Acts chapter 2, when Peter talks about the tribulation and all, and then he says, and who, as whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's called, the Lord is the, is the Savior, and it's His work at the cross that provided salvation. They, didn't, they don't understand it up this time. Even Ananias telling Paul to do this didn't understand it, and yet... It's part of the process of God bringing salvation even to the kingdom saints is by calling on the name of the Lord because it's His blood that finally washed away the sins. And, uh, and, and that's important because the kingdom saints didn't get saved by their works. Their, their, their faith required them to be water baptized, identifying with the Lord who is the Savior and who has now provided salvation for them. And, and so um, that's what Ananias told Saul to do and Certainly Saul did it and, and was forgiven of his sins. And then God began to fulfill what was told him, uh, told Ananias would be accomplished. Go back to Acts 22.
in verses 17 and following, uh, I'm just going to read you a couple of verses, but in, in 17 actually through 21 is where Ananias, what he told Saul in verse uh, 15, 14 and 15, that, that Saul was this vessel that's going to be revealed, uh, that the Lord is going to, has chosen him to know his will, to see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. There's a fulfillment that Paul now is going to bring about and, and tell them of. It says in verse 17, it says, And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. Now, maybe I'll do this in an in abbreviated way. The, when he first says, when it says, And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, he, he went from the time that he was on the road to Damascus and then in Damascus and saw Ananias to a time in which he comes to Jerusalem. And now he doesn't tell us which time this is. We know from the Galatian testimony that it was three years after his conversion that he made his first visit to, to Jerusalem. In our Acts study, there were several other verse, uh, trips to Jerusalem that Saul made along the way. It seems to me this must be an early time uh, just because of the revelation that was given to him to come. So this is probably three years after his conversion in verse 17. He just, but here he says, it just simply says, And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I, w I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. Now speaking to the Jews that he's speaking about, here he's at Jerusalem. They're upset with him being at Jerusalem and at the temple, but he's going back to the fact that when the Lord had revealed himself to him and Ananias assured him this was all of God and, and that God would reveal more to him, that he says that, that after that he came to Jerusalem, and he's not just in Jerusalem, he actually went into the temple, and he's praying to God in the temple. And something happened to him while he's praying to God in the temple. Now that, that should have respect unto these law-zealous, uh, abiding, <laughs> law-abiding, zealous Jews. And, and that's why he puts it that way, that what happened to him, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. Now, that's, a trance is an altered state of mind. <laughs> you know, when you talk about a trance, it's not necessarily like a dream or a vision. In fact, there's only four times that the King James Bible uses the word trance. Interesting. The first time is back in the book of Numbers. Go back to Numbers chapter 24. And what's interesting about it is how, when it's used what the subject matter regards. This is where, in Numbers 24, this is where Balaam is hired by Balak to curse, he's a Gentile king who wants the nation of Israel who's coming through his land to be cursed. And he hires uh, Balaam to curse the nation of Israel, actually trying to pay him because he can't pay me to do something uh, when I open my mouth and God speaks, it's going to have to be God's word. And uh, so anyhow, he, this is what's taking place here. And, and you'll see what happens. Numbers 24, in verse 1 it says, And when Balaam saw, saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he went not as other times to seek for enchantments, but he set his, his face toward the wilderness. And Balaam lifted up his eyes, and he saw Israel abiding in his tents, according to their tribes, and the Spirit of God came upon him. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam the son of Beor hath said, The man whose eyes were opened hath said, He hath said, which heard the words of God, and saw a vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, and have, but, but having his eyes open. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob! and thy tabernacle, O Israel. So he ends up blessing Israel, but he's calling, he, he looks and he sees, and he's got this vision going, and, and he says he's in a trance. And in, in that trance, he begins to bless Israel. Um, where do I want to pick up on that? Well, Balak gets mad at him for that. Uh, verse 11, Balak says this, the, the king that hired him said this to him, Therefore now... Flee thou to thy, thy place. I have thought to promote thee unto great honor, but lo, the Lord hath kept thee back from honor. <laughs> He's actually, 
you, I paid you. I could have made you in, 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 a, in a high position, but the Lord prevented you because you're blessing Israel instead of cursing them. So it happens again. It says, And Balak said to, uh, Balaam said to Balak, Speak not I unto, uh, uh, not also to thy messengers, which thou sentest unto me, saying, If Balak shall give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord to do either good or bad of my, of, of my own mind. But what the Lord has said, that will I speak. And now behold, I go unto my people. Come therefore, and I will advise thee of what this people shall do to thy people in the latter days. And, they took, and he took up his parable and said, Balaam, the son of Peor, has said, The man whose eyes were open has said, He hath said, which heard the words of the Lord, and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling in a trance, but having his eyes open, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall arise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheph. And Edom shall be a, pos a possession. Sure also shall be a possession for his enemies and Israel shall do valiantly. Out of Jacob shall come he that hath dominion and he shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. Well, who's the one that's going to have dominion? The Lord Jesus. You, think, you know how the book of Jude ends? Now unto him be dominion and honor, glory forever. Amen. And that's, that's Jesus Christ is going to come back and set up, set up the kingdom. He is the star that's going to come out of Jacob. They saw his star in the east when, when he was born. And uh, so he ends up, Israel is going to be blessed because God said they're going to be blessed. So that's the vision that's the, in, that, that he had a trance that Balaam had. Now you're familiar with the other, Acts chapter 10. When Peter is told to go to Cornelius, or preparing Peter to go to Cornelius, he's in the house of, of Simon the Tanner, he's up on the roof, it's getting near dinner time, he's hungry, and, uh, or lunchtime, it's the sixth hour, and it says in verse 10 that and he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they, while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and a vessel descending upon him. And then that's how he has this vision that it's okay to go to Cornelius, to visit Cornelius. So he also falls into a trance concerning him going to a Gentile. Well, the Apostle Paul, back in Acts chapter 22, he tells these Jews, zealous of the law, he's in the temple, he's in Jerusalem, in the temple, and he falls into a trance. And then it says in verse 18, Acts 22, 18, and it says, And saw him saying unto me. Now, remember the three things Ananias said in verse, was it verse uh, 14? That, that Saul was going to happen to Saul? You're going to know his will. You're going to see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. So he's ha having this trance in the temple, and he saw, there's the just one, him saying unto me, there's the voice of his mouth, so what's God's will then? Get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. <laughs> now that's part A <laughs> in this portion of God's will for the for. For Saul of Tarsus, who's going to be Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles. But what Ananias told Paul, he's actually repeating in verse 17 and 18, and all the way down to verse 21, to let these people that are listening to him know that this is all of God, because just as it was prophesied of him, it came true. He did learn what God's will is. He saw the just one. He heard the voice of his mouth. They're just not going to like what the Lord said. <laughs> and when he gets to that part B, they, they won't listen to him any longer. So I, I wanted to get to that point to at least bring that to you and, uh, and, and see where he's going with all this. And we'll, we'll bring that, probably the whole chapter, to a close next time. I'm going to stop there, though. Did anybody have any more problem with Saul being baptized in verse 16? 
Do you have any, any problem with Israel being required to be water baptized for the remission of sins? When you tie it into being identified with the Lord Jesus Christ and the remission of sins that's through His blood, uh, you're not just believing in works for salvation that so often we're accused of when we talk about Israel's salvation. But there, what faith is, is faith is just believing God. And if God said through John, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, faith does what God said to do. It's an obedience to faith. For us today to be obedient to faith, it's to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of your grace. And we thank you that we can see the difference between what Ananias would tell Saul of Tarsus to do and why he would tell him to do it. But yet realizing that you gave a revelation to Saul who became Paul our apostle and that through him we learn what you would require us to do in order to be saved. And certainly it's to rest by faith alone in the finished work of your son, trusting his death, burial, and resurrection to be the complete payment of our sins. And we thank you, Father, that we can demonstrate your grace today by doing nothing for salvation, but believing on him that justifieth the ungodly. So thank you for this truth, and thank you for the security that that gives us, because if there was something for us to do, we'd fail. But the fact that it's done completely, and you save us and seal us by your Spirit the moment we believe, we can be assured and confident of our salvation. We thank you for that in Christ's name. Amen.